fill in the blank. You're not getting any younger. So, so lighten up and love yourself. Hey, you. Yes, you. Welcome to the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast, a podcast for people who want to disrupt their lives for a good reason, to make it count. I'm your host, Jen Glantz, and every week, I'll drop a new episode with stories from real people, just like you, who woke up one morning and decided to make big changes, starting with small things. We'll cover topics like entrepreneurship, love, failure, and self-care. Hey, you're not getting any younger, so let's make this an adventure. Ready? Hey you, welcome back to another episode of You're Not Getting Any Younger. Thank you for plugging in your earbuds and pressing the play button on this very episode. I am Jen Glantz, the hostess with the mostest pizza stains on her Snuggie right about now. Today's episode is all about words. Danny Katz is one of LA's edgiest literary talents and the author of The New P Handbook Volume 1, Little Language Hacks for Big Change. She's on the show today helping us figure out the words we should use, the ones we should lose, and why we should all just stop saying sorry when we really don't mean it. Your words are powerful, my dear friends, and it's time to start learning how to pick and choose the ones that are going to make you sound like a superhero version of yourself. Hey, thanks for tuning in. You make this show feel like magic. If you're loving what you're hearing, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes and come hang out with the rest of the You're Not Getting Any Younger listeners in the You're Not Getting Any Younger secret Facebook group. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Well, let's jump right in. Thank you so much, Danny, for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me, Jen. Of course. So how's your morning been so far? Um, it's been busy. I made it, I meditated, I did my affirmations, I pulled tarot, I've been, uh, I'm working on a book right now, so I've been doing some book stuff. It's been super busy given that it's only 9 a.m. in California. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, wow, you've done more things than people have done their entire eight hours that they go to work. <laughs> That's crazy. So what does a typical morning usually look like for you? Um, well, typical morning is I like to wake up before the sunrise because I love the liminal. I love those threshold spaces. I like seeing the sun rise. So I'll generally wake up around five. Um, if it's a Monday, Wednesday or Friday, I will have some lemon water and head straight to the gym to swim 50 laps. Um, (laughs) have you been swimming all your life? No, I just started in November because I fractured my foot last year and got fat. Um, (laughs) And they say swimming is like the hardest and the best exercise for people to do. Yes, it's so hard. And like literally every time I'll be one lap in and I'm like, I hate this. It's too hard. I'm tired. I want to (laughs) stop. So how do you keep going? Because I have tried to swim like three laps before. And by the end of it, I am out of breath. I feel like I just ran a marathon. So how do you mentally keep going when you feel like that? Um, you know what? It's so funny that I found this, um, this arm workout on YouTube with this woman named Ostrid and it's a little bit cheesy. It's, it's put out by Cosmopolitan and when she's doing the workout, she'll say, just get it done. And I have that as a mantra in my mind, like just get it done. It doesn't matter whether I like it or not. Just keep going. Um, and then I'm also like at the same time being really grateful that I'm in water because my nervous system loves water so much. And then I, I, I do a lot of gratitude tricks. Like I'm so grateful that I'm strong and that I'm healthy and that my limbs are working and that I can do this. You know, maybe there'll be a time in my life where I won't be as agile and I won't be as strong. So I just kind of a, a lot of like mental tricks and then I'll like sing in my head. There's always like a song on a loop or I'll like work out storylines for whatever script I'm working on. <laughs> That's the interesting part is, is swimming is the kind of sport you could say that you are so isolated. You're so by yourself. You can't have your phone in the pool with you yet. They haven't really invented a way to do that. And you can't have, you know, music playing while you're underneath the water. So what are you working out in your head? Do you find yourself having conversations about, you know, problems you're going through? Or do you find yourself using that as the time to be super creative? Um, it's really both. So I've been um, adult, developing a t- TV series for the past few years. So it's definitely a great place 
to work out like storylines or little bits of conflict. Um, and then when I am triggered, as far as interpersonal relationships, I definitely use my time in the pool to quite literally cool me down because I because I'm super fiery. And just to look at like, where is this me? You know, where is this my unintegrated trauma? So I, I definitely use it as a place to like chew on things in my mind. And I'm also like, I love that it's a place where the phone cannot go. You know, I like that I'm, I'm just faced with my thoughts. Which can be scary for some people, right? Do you ever find yourself feeling a little bit overwhelmed when you're so isolated like that with your thoughts? I don't. Um, I love being isolated with my thoughts. And I, I actually haven't ever understood people. And I, I, I like I get that it's real that people have a fear of going there. Um, but that, that's my comfort zone. Like I'm an Aquarius and I'm an introvert and I'm super heady and I'm a deep abstract thinker. So I love being alone in my head. And I also like I, I've I've studied a lot of different mystical and spiritual traditions and uh, Pema children and actually all the Buddhists will talk about like how we don't want to shove things under the rug like we don't want dark dusty corners of our mind that we're afraid to go in. Um, so I I like to be in my head and to go to the places that scare me so that I can like shine light on them and take the fear away. You know I'm very much a believer that the only way out is through. So and I also think it's impossible to be a grown adult if you're not comfortable being alone with yourself. I think it's really like the, the crucial thing that separates being, you know, immaturity to maturity and, and childhood to adulthood is learning to be alone with ourselves and learning to be comfortable and, and really learning to love it because we are the only ones we can really count on um, to be with That's for this so whole true. crazy ride. <laughs> it's so true. And, and I, I've always loved spending time with myself. In fact, when I find myself at a lack because I haven't been alone in a while, I crave it so much, almost just to reset my emotions and my thoughts. But do you have advice for people who find themselves anxious when it comes to diving into their thoughts, being alone, meditating? Is there an amount of time they should strive for every day to do that? Or is that just a practice that they should just implement more into their lives on a weekly basis? Um, well, I'm a, I'm a daily meditator. I've been meditating daily since my mid twenties, so I'm a, I'm a huge fan and proponent of that. And it, and as well, like I never prescribe meditation for anyone. Like people have to really want it. But I also I'm, I recommend. I think it's more important to have a daily meditation practice than to, to drop in every now and again. And so, you know, like I'm a transformational coach. So when I'm working with clients, I'll say like, can you commit to three minutes of meditation today? And my whole thing is set the bar really low. Like even, and if that's too much, like, can you do 90 seconds a day? And then to just pendul pendulate and for us to push our edges. So like, okay, if I can do 90 seconds for a month, then can I take it up to two minutes and just start to get, you know, more and more comfortable with the spaces that scare us. So I, I think it's more important to like take our time and to dip our toes in slowly um, than to immerse ourselves and freak ourselves out or avoid them altogether. Like I think that the middle path and being gentle is really the key. I love that because sometimes you talk to people about meditation and I've always had a struggle sitting down and meditating and people will say, just commit to 10 minutes, do it for 20 minutes. And I'm thinking that is way too much time. And I like how you said 90 seconds, you know, commit to what you think you can do that day and build on it. And I think that's such a great tool for anything that people want to go into and try because it can be scary to commit more time than you really, really, really can get through. So I love that. I want to start your story off with the topic of being a journalist. You received a master's in journalism from USC. I also majored in journalism when I was back in college and I left college pretty unsure how to use that degree, but you've taken that master's in journalism and you've had quite a career with it. So when you left school with that degree, what were your plans on what you were going to do to pursue journalism? Well, my plans got kind of eroded while I was in grad school because that's when I started to realize that like the real deal investigative journalism that I wanted to do didn't really exist anymore. Um, so I was interning at CNN back in the day and I just wasn't really fulfilled. So I, I kind of had a, a meandering path where um, straight out of grad school, I, I was a publicist and then I produced a documentary and then I like 
traveled around the world for a couple of years being a hippie. Um, and then I was reporting and producing the news for KPFK Pacifica, which was really, um, it felt important and it was really gratifying because I was on the front lines and our editors were very open. We weren't tied to like a bottom line or profit. And I, I could report real news without having to like warp it for corporate interests. But the downside of that was being attached to the AP wire every day and doing like deep, deep, deep investigation into global events um, was really depressing. And when, once I got like the real macro picture of what was going on in the world, um, I was really angry. I was really sad. Um, and I, I, what I realized from all of that is that I don't have the right constitution to be able to hold all of that and not be an unhappy person. <laughs> yeah. And this wasn't, we're not talking about, you know, 2017, 2018. This was a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. This was back after, like after the twin towers fell. So it was diving deep into like, you know, when, when Bush was, was naming the access of evil and diving in, that was when the North Korea thing started to break down. And I was diving really deep into that and, and doing a lot of investigation as far as what really happened with the Twin Towers. And it was just, it's just a lot for like one little sensitive consciousness to hold and still vibe high. And ultimately, I just realized like, it's great I mean, I don't even know that it's great to know all these things. Like it's yeah. certainly, it's like, there's a perverse pleasure in my intellect and it was cool kind of to be at like dinner parties and whatnot and know everything that was going on and feel like the smartest person in the room, but it wasn't making me a happy person. And it wasn't like optimizing my, my creativity. It was making me, yeah, it was just bumming me out. Um, so I, I pulled away hardcore for, from news after that. So after you realized, listen, I got to go. I can't do this. What was your what was your next step? Oh, that's a good question. What was my next step? Um, well, I was working for a documentary producer who did, he made the movie Crop Circles Quest for Truth. Um, and so I was researching documentaries for him for a while, which was super fun. And then I got hooked up with the LA Weekly and started to write about consciousness and metaphysics and art and, and realize like, okay, I, I, I kind of, I did stay in journalism, but I shifted from hard news to more like culture and more sort of like first person cheeky pieces and cultural criticism from like more of a distance. And then I was at the LA Weekly for like nine years. They called me their go-to nutter butter writer, which was like anything that was sort of out there, you know, like New Paradigm or Burning Man or Entheogens or Raw Food or Colonics or anything like wild, they would just send me to cover. And that was super fun. And those, those were kind of the last days of journalism where I had a great relationship with my editors and um, journalists were still paid well and I could write about whatever I want. And that was super fun. You've been in this industry. So since then, you have gone on to be the author of the new P, the new paradigm handbook, Little Language Hacks for Big Changes. I find or I feel that an alternate title for this book could be Every Word <laughs> Matters, which I feel yeah. like is a big slogan for you. So what does that phrase mean, Every Word Matters? Um, so every word matters is pointing to the fact that, um, language is the fundamental building block of our entire reality. Like it, it is the construct that frames how we filter reality, how we organize reality. Um, we don't just use words to communicate with others, but our, our thoughts are framed through words. We all think in words and think in language. Um, and language is the number one means of programming the subconscious mind, which is responsible for 95% of our experience of reality. And the subconscious mind is actually what sends signals out for how or reality organizes itself. And so what every word matters means is that neither the subconscious mind or the universe are ever asleep on the job. They're hearing and responding to every word we say. So specifically when we're using words to put ourselves down or to make ourselves small, um, that's all having effect on, on our subconscious mind. Um, and at, as well as on our relationships and as well as on the universe at, at large. And so, um, it's, it's crucial for us to pay attention to every word and to our languaging patterns because, um, I don't think most people realize how we are the ones sabotaging ourselves and we are doing it with our every word. 
Did that I make sense? Yeah, and I didn't really realize <laughs> that either until when I read through the book, I thought, wow, words are way more powerful than we think. You know, we always hear words are powerful because they can hurt people, they can offend people, they can reduce your credibility, they can make you seem not confident. But after reading this book, I thought to myself, words are more powerful than just how you portray yourself outwardly. They're also powerful on how you conduct yourself with your with your anxieties, with your fears, with everything that has to do internally as well. You mentioned a part in the book when it comes to the subconscious section where we can say, I'm not afraid, but our subconscious mind instead goes through what? You know, even if we tell ourselves that we're not afraid, what still happens inside of our body? Yeah. So, so when we tell ourselves we're not afraid, the subconscious mind attaches to the word afraid. So the subconscious mind isn't really all that smart. Um, it, it, it operates and it responds to generalities. It doesn't understand nuance. It doesn't understand sarcasm. Um, so yeah, when we say I am not afraid, we're actually affirming the vibrational frequency of fear and we're inviting the subconscious mind to connect to being afraid versus saying, I am courageous, and then the subconscious mind just gets to focus on giving us the experience of having courage. It's interesting to, to note like how often people are framing the reality in terms of the negative, mm. which only which only gives us these these experiences that we think we're negating. I think that's so true. And do you think that most people are trained to speak in the negatives? I think they're unconsciously trained and I think they're unconsciously programmed to speak in the negatives because I think that this, this, this system, this, this matrix, this construct that we're living in is dependent on us feeling limited, um, having crummy self-esteem, you know, it's definitely dependent upon us being small for it to run. So I think that it's unconscious, you know, it's not like our parents meant to limit us. I, I it's not even like our, our teachers or, or any of our so-called authority figures. I think it's just been bred into this system for so long that people don't even realize, like I, I, I work with a lot of clients on this and a lot of times I'll give them exercises to like, affirm their wonderfulness and to, you know, to speak about their value. And so often it's like, oh, that feels too much. Like, I don't want to be conceited or I don't want to be arrogant. And it's weird how in this culture, having positive self-esteem and thinking highly of ourselves is considered a negative. Yeah. And it's also something I think that goes back to social media. It's you relate to people who are sort of in the middle, right? If someone's so negative on social media, you're, you're sort of like, oh, wait, that was a little bit of oversharing. And if they're so positive, you start to form this story in your head that they are conceited and bragging and all of these things when really it's just an unfamiliar thing that you're looking at because not a lot of people around you are that positive. And it's very interesting how we view positive speech sometimes as being very full of yourself, but it's not. Yeah, it it definitely is not. I mean, certainly there are arrogant people, but that's obviously not what we're referencing. And I think what it is, is because we are a self-esteem deficient culture. um, And, you know, on so many levels that when we hear people or or we're witnessing people who have positive self-esteem and and are speaking from that place, we're triggered because our lack of self-esteem is being triggered. And there's an unconscious envy for that. And because we don't have that, and all this is going on unconsciously, then we criticize it and we we reject it. But the trick as far as like transforming and optimizing our potential is noticing that when we're triggered by something, that's a clue that there's, there's something inside of us that's wanting healing, that's wanting attention, that's wanting to evolve. It's true. And it's, it's also just about being aware of what's really going on inside of you. You know, so I agree. Sometimes I'll look at a situation and find myself angry or jealous. And I had to take a step back and say, it's less about that person. And it's more about the lack inside of me and what I'm looking for and what I'm missing. And I find that very true. In your book, you refer to the principle of quantum languaging. Can you explain more about that? Yeah, so quantum languaging is is the umbrella term that I've given to this study of, I mean, what I'll call word witchery that I've been into for the past, I don't know, 15 years. Um, And the gist is, it's a languaging paradigm where we're examining language beyond just intellectual connotation, beyond just dictionary definition of words. And we're honing in on the fact that every word has a unique vibrational frequency, like a fingerprint. And that vibrational frequency 
has a palpable effect on our emotional body, on our psychological body, and on our energetic body. And so quantum languaging is a more expansive, integrated languaging orientation where we're using words with this in mind. So like a great example would be the word should, which, you know, for all intents and purposes might seem neutral, but the word should has um, a, on a, a vibrational level is it indicates uh, a gestalt wherein whoever's using the word should is alleging to have authority over the person that they're talking to, right? If I tell you, you know, you should cut grains out from your diet, I'm speaking to you as though I know better and I have some sort of authority over you, which isn't acknowledging your autonomous agency over yourself. Um, so for someone like me, and this has been my whole life, when someone gives me advice that comes along with a should, my whole body contracts. Um, there's like a cortisol response where it's like a, a release of a stress hormone. And I don't even hear the words that trail the should because my rebel consciousness is saying, don't tell me what to do. Um, so it's just looking at language from this perspective and realizing, well, what are the words that seem neutral that I'm using that are totally perving my communication and making it harder for people to hear me, harder for my message to land, causing friction in my relationships, that sort of thing. In the book, you also talk about words to avoid. So try, can't, should. And a lot of those words are just so ingrained in our speech and our thought process. And you mentioned that language is, is our, there, it's habits that we have. So how do we go about changing these habits that we've had for 30 years, 50 years? You know, how do you, how do you do that? Yeah. Um, I mean, that's where a, a meditation practice or a mindfulness practice comes in because the more that we have a little bit of detached awareness or even a lot of bit of detached awareness to be able to hear ourselves, the better. And still the number one way to do it is to have a community and to have other people helping. So, um, when I started this work, I, um, a few friends, we, we all kind of got on board with the words that we were going to keep an eye out on one another. Um, and I call it calling each other in because the idea of calling each other out kind of um, activates that outcast wound that a lot of us carry. It's, it's super primal. Um, but the gist is to have friends and community who are hip to, to the quantum languaging precepts and who can be an extra set of ears. Um, and when we have permission so, you know, like I was hiking with a girlfriend yesterday and, and she was saying, you know, I'm going to try to X, Y, Z. And I'm like, are you going to try to, or are you going to do it? Mm. And so it, it's it, with the languaging, it's so helpful to have extra ears. When I consult with um, teams and organizations, I get everyone on board to call one another in when they're using disempowering languaging. That's the easiest and quickest way is to have people there who can reflect back our blind spots because they are habits and we might not hear it. I mean, when I record my, my words are matter videos, um, I'm generally shocked when I'm, when I'm editing them and I'm like, wow, I use that word and that word and that word and that word, you know? Um, so it, it does take a little bit of, of extra effort and teamwork, but it's super easy once, you know, it's just a matter of reframing once we get in the practice of hearing ourselves. And the more that we practice um, and the more that we know our habits and we know our tendencies, then it's easier to, to sort of catch them. It's, it's, it's really just an awareness thing. It's completely true. I teach a lot of public speaking and uh, the person that I teach for, he was shadowing my classes for a while and he told me that I use the verbal filler word actually. And I never, Ooh. ever, ever realized that I used it. But he was sitting in the back of my class. And every time I would use it, he would call it out. And it was in a fun, playful way. He'd say, you're actually going to do that? And it really got me to pause when I was speaking, go slower, and really avoid that word. And it changed my speech pattern. And one of the, the words I want to talk to you about that I have a huge problem kicking out of my vocabulary because I use it in the wrong way is the word sorry. I find that I'll be out and about, someone will bump into me and I'll say sorry to them. And it's one of those words, it's just, it's a behavior almost that I just can't seem to kick. And you write about this in, our, in your book. How do you get away from using sorry and not spitting it out in the wrong context? 
Yeah. Um, so, I mean, first and foremost, I, I, I just took some notes on what you just said. Um, and in, in saying, like, I have a huge problem with rooting this one out, it's just to decide that, like, um, I'm, I'm choosing to, to transmute my sorry addiction, you know? And so to definitely language your relationship with sorry as, like, this is easy for you to, to get the, to switch this up. Um, and to affirm that you can and you are easily rooting sorry out. So the thing with sorry, and I see it more so with women yes. than I see it with men, is like, what is the pattern underlying that? Like, where are we? Why are we apologizing for our existence or for, you know, for taking a little bit longer in the bathroom? Or it, it's kind of this weird thing. I, I tie it into a not enoughness an underlying not enoughness program. So for that piece of it, um, I definitely, there's this great EFT tapping video online by this guy, Brad Yates called I am enough. Um, and so that's really helpful in just setting up the subconscious mind into an I am enough orientation. And that will really help get some distance on the inclination to toss out the saris. And the, the other thing with sorry is like, a lot of the time it happens when we're surprised, like we bump into yes. someone, and it's a little bit shocking to the system. Um, and so it's that like, we're shocked, but then we go for sorry, which puts us in this sort of like, deferential position and spread sorrow. And so I'm a big fan of saying surprise. Yes. It's like, okay, that happened. And then it's making it fun and playful. So I bump into someone and I'm like, surprise, <laughs> we just had a thing. And then all of a sudden it becomes, you know, like a game and, and there's levity and we, we can laugh at it. And it's, the thing is, is that it, what we want to do is acknowledge, like, that's the key is we want to acknowledge, yes, I bumped into someone. Yes, I, my ass is in your face as I'm trying to like move through this narrow aisle. Um, and sorry is not our wisest way to do it. So it's just picking another word that is going to do the acknowledging, but that isn't steeped in sorrow. And so my favorite for that is surprise. But and it kind of doesn't even matter. It's just like, oh, hey, I bumped into you. Like, let's have a dance. Something that acknowledges that this is happening, but that also doesn't put a judgment on it or make it a bad thing or make it seem that like we're a perpetrator of some like atrocity. <laughs> it's so true. And, and this is something that I've really been trying to work on to the point where when I find myself saying sorry for situations that I shouldn't be, I'll then beat myself up about it. So like, I'll say sorry to the person, they'll walk away and then I'll go, oh, and then I'll say a bad word, you know, because I'm really really trying to work on this. And when I was reading the book, I laughed out loud so hard because you say replace sorry with surprise or thank you or congratulations. And I thought that that was such a fun way to work on this is switch that because then it makes a situation laughable and it makes it less uncomfortable and awkward. And it also just plays on the fact that this is almost like a verbal tick that a lot of people have is just to say sorry when they don't really mean it or they shouldn't be saying it. So I really, really enjoyed that part. You really work hard, I feel like, in this book to make people aware of language and of words. What are the benefits for people to start to study this and really implement this into their life? Oh, wow. The benefits are so many. Um, it's really empowering. Um, you mentioned earlier that, you know, this isn't just about how when we're communicating with others, but it's about our self talk. And that's where I find um, quantum languaging to me most applicable. So it's really helpful in rooting out the ways that we are putting ourselves down in our head, or we're beating ourselves up, or we're just being flat out unkind. So by rooting out the words that we're using to speak to ourselves, it, it's empowering. Um, it, it really, really facilitates self love, um, and self compassion. It, uh, it makes things in interacting with other people way more fun. It really um, helps with collaboration because this is a language of empowerment and this is a language of encouragement. So with these little adjustments, like it makes relationships so much better 
and um, co-creating so much better because we're using words that expand other people and bring out the best in them as well as expanding ourselves. Um, so it's just a very like expansive, inclusive languaging paradigm. And it like at a really basic level, which is one of my parties, it makes everything so much more fun. It just really lends a playful, it's all okay. We're all learning quality. Um, to the experience of being incarnate. And for me, like having fun in this lifetime is, is like the number one thing. <laughs> Amen to that. How do you think specifically it could help in the workplace? Um, it definitely helps in the workplace as far as hierarchy. And I find when I do work with organizations, um, that there, there are subtle communication cues where where employees don't, you know, necessarily feel acknowledged or don't feel valued or don't feel respected or can be barreled over. So I think it's really helpful um, in, in helping people feel acknowledged, in encouraging and supporting one another. Um, it's definitely helpful in, um, you know, like I, there's sort of a lot of, of the same principles that people use in improv to help people to encourage them to participate, to encourage them to bring their best and to give their pe best. Um, it's, it's really helpful it just in terms of um, quelling any workplace tensions um, and depersonalizing a lot of communication ticks that might not work for, for people, but, you know, to not, you know, make them a thing where we're, we're going to have to be at odds. Um, it's really helpful for creating like objective, um, neutral, equanimous, up-leveled relationships between team members. Definitely. And the best part I ever took from improv was yes and. That's the best mm -hmm. technique to use because it just really makes everyone feel included and it's a great way of continuing a conversation without leaving people out. The final part of your book, you talk about quantum self-talk hacks. I love this. There's an exercise on page 96 of the book where you ask people to spend 15 to 20 minutes and write down all the negative thoughts they have about themselves. I tried this in 20 minutes. I am embarrassed by how many thoughts that were negative that came out of me. But the second half of this workshop is that you ask them to go back through that list and rewrite each statement so it's positive and supportive. Why is an exercise like this important for people to do? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. I just got another chill because it's the most important exercise. Um, it's crucial because going back to the very beginning, every word matters. So every time we're thinking a negative thought about ourselves, we're driving that belief system deeper into our subconscious mind and we're deepening those neural network grooves in our brain. So if it's like, you know, I'm, I'm behind, right? That's, that's one that I have historically played with. I'm, I'm behind. I'm not doing enough. Anytime I think that I'm strengthening that muscle in my brain and I'm just making that story bigger and more real. And so it's so crucial whenever we find ourselves having a negative thought to immediately rewrite it for the positive. Like I'm, you know, I am aligned with dime, divine timing. I am right on time. I am, you know, exactly where I need to be, because then we're creating new neural network connections, we're writing new stories for ourselves. Um, and we're setting up our brains and our nervous systems and our subconscious minds, um, just for the better, you know, for the more supportive, for the more empowered, for the kinder, for the more compassionate. And so I'm really diligent about the rewrites, because um, you know, you, you said you were embarrassed about the amount of negative thoughts. And, and the thing is, is, we all have them, every single one of us. And it, it's a constant process to root out how many we have. Um, and the key is, is, is when we catch ourselves thinking them, like, that's great. Like, that's, that's a triumph because, okay, well, we have the objectivity to see where we have been um, putting ourselves down in the past. That's great neutral data. And now I have the sovereignty and the resources to rewrite that and choose something different for myself. So those rewrites are really, really crucial. Oh, and one more thing I wanted to say was as far as um, the, the sorries, my favorite way to call people in when they throw out an unnecessary sorry is to say, apology rejected. <laughs> I love that. I hope I meet you in person and, and use that and you say that to me because I would just <laughs> hug you and just laugh because it's amazing. It's like such a fun way to live life when you pay attention to these kinds of words. For the self-talk hacks, 
do you recommend then reading that out loud? Do you think it needs to be something that's read out loud and said with power to believe these words? Because, you know, I can flip the I'm not good enough to I am great at doing this, this and this and writing that on paper. But do you think I also or people also have to take that added step of saying it out loud, saying it with power and truly believing it when they say it? Uh, I do. And I think especially as, as that was what came to you, for sure for you, you know, the fact that you know that and you've honed in on that intuitively. Absolutely. And, and for me as well, I, some people get embarrassed to speak to themselves out loud. I don't. So uh, yes, I think with, con- with conviction out loud is crucial. And as well, like for me, I like to make a gesture, you know, and like kind of make it a dance and make it really fun for myself so that my whole being gets it. And also like I, you know, I talk to myself out loud all day, every day. I'm constantly reframing. Um, And there are times where we'll catch ourselves having those thoughts and maybe we're in like a board meeting or we're teaching a workshop and it's not really appropriate to all of a sudden like relanguage something. So in those instances, it's totally fine to do it in our minds. I think the key is to just to be super diligent and not ever let an instance of negative self-talk slip without a reframe. Um, And to do it compassionately, you know, always with love. It's like, we're not ever wrong when we catch ourselves um, speaking poorly about ourselves. You know, we don't want to add shame to it. We don't want, we don't want to punish ourselves. It's just like being really neutral and like, Oh, I see where that programming is rearing its head And then, yes, I do think with as much conviction um, and power and joy as possible to relanguage it out loud is incredibly effective. What's the best way for people to start doing this? Do you think it's every time you find yourself with a negative thought, write it down on a paper? How do people get into this practice daily? Um. I think the key first thing would be to, to, for people to educate themselves on, on the words not to use and the languaging patterns that aren't helping. Um, and then once we have them, I don't, I think if we want to write them down, it would be the first time that we clue into the negative thought, we would write them down and write down the upgrade. But then from there, it's a matter of practice. Um, and, and hearing ourselves and, and then it comes down to, being mindful and being aware. And, you know, if, if someone isn't a daily meditator to start off with a 90 second meditation practice to start to get in the habit of get creating some distance from our mind and creating some distance from the words that are constantly running through our minds. Um, and that distance then applies to self-talk. Then with that distance, we can apply it to how we're talking to other people. And then if possible to, you know, invite our friends into this realm with us. You know, I I have some people who they don't just buy my book for themselves, but they'll buy copies for people in their family and people they work closest to um, so that they can all help one another. But it really is. It's a it's an all day, every day matter of observing ourselves, um, which might sound like a lot. But the gist is is because we're using words all day, every day. It's such a great opportunity for us to be able to master a quantum languaging practice very quickly. It's really easy with texts and emails. That's actually the best way because when we're seeing our words before we send them, it's great to get in the practice of like, wait, wait, wait hold on. Let me check, you know, like my list of words to, to avoid and words, you know, what are the upgrades and to check it. And that's a great way to sort of get a leg up on our languaging patterns is when we're looking at them um, through the written word or the typed word. I love that, Danny. Your advice is incredible. I'm so grateful for everything that you said. I want to end with a quick lightning round. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and respond with whatever comes to mind first. Okay. When you were a kid, what did you want to grow up to become? Oh, I wanted to be the speechwriter for the president because I wanted the power to restructure society, but I didn't want to be famous or in the public eye. And I didn't understand how politics works, obviously. <laughs> well, what is your dream job now? Is it the same thing? Um, right now, I want to be um, do quantum languaging coaching for all the people in the intellectual dark web. And I also want um, to be writing and producing my own television series. What is the best advice anyone has ever given you? Ooh, relax. <laughs>
That's a hard one to follow for sure. <laughs> Danny, fill in the blank. You're not getting any younger. So. So lighten up and love yourself. I love that. Danny Katz, it was so great talking to you. Please tell our listeners where they can find out more about you and your book. They can find everything about me at dannykatz.com, D-A-N-I-K-A-T-Z. I post daily on Instagram. You can click through to my Instagram from there. I post videos on YouTube every week. And um, yeah, there's lots of, lots of, lots of stuff online. Well, we will link to your book on our website, anyyounger.com. Thank you so much, Danny. It was a pleasure chatting with you today. Thank you, Jen. I really enjoyed it. Hey, you. Thank you for listening to the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast. There are hundreds of thousands of pods out there, so thank you for listening to this one. You can find the show notes for this week's episode up on our website, anyyounger.com. Subscribe, rate, and review the You're Not Getting Any Younger podcast on iTunes so that other ears around the world can listen too. Oh, and join our secret You're Not Getting Any Younger Facebook group where over 1,000 people are talking about how to disrupt their lives for a good reason, to make it count. Until next week, all my love, Jen Glantz.